morning. Is this working okay? Well, thank you for having me here. You know, I was just uh, thinking that uh, maybe it's a disadvantage of getting old, but uh, my uh, first mission of the mission probably uh, went with background explorer. One of the mission requirements that they lay on the mission team was no computers. <laughs> Believe it or not, and uh, you know, we launched in 1989. Um, and because at the time, at least, there had been several recent missions that had really gotten tied around the uh, uh, around the axle with uh, uh, flight software issues and with, uh, with computer hardware issues. So now, what, what's uh, really gratifying about having you here today is we're now moving more and more and more into an era where a, a very uh, greatly increasing fraction of the functionality of uh, any of our spacecraft and any of our instruments. Uh, resides in the flight software. Uh, perhaps a bigger challenge that I was just talking with Mike Aguilar is that uh, when we start seeing with uh, FPGA that have uh, over 10 million gates in them, we're also seeing a world in which the uh, the lines are very, very much blurred between what has traditionally been firmware uh, and hardware. Uh, and I know a number of uh, folks in this community are wrestling with that problem. We have some uh, groups internally that are, are trying to figure out exactly how to do that, bringing many of the techniques of uh, configuration management and the uh, design um, uh, techniques from uh, the flight software world uh, into that, uh, what has been uh, the firmware world. And I think we're going to see a, a very much a blending of, uh, of those disciplines. Uh, and I think the, the other big trend that I see, which I welcome very much, uh, is the uh, the evolution toward uh, toward systems where we're intentionally structured a lot a lot of reuse. Uh, so, for example, we're we're making a lot of use of the uh, uh, flight uh, software that originated at Goddard, but has become a community product across NASA uh, and elsewhere. Um, and that's uh, to me that's a that's also a very gratifying development because we we can't be writing everything from scratch every time. We we'll need to be able to do things from that. So with that, uh, I am going to give you a bit of a flashback uh, and an overview of ATL because I'm going to flashback uh, uh, almost 75 years uh, uh, to start. So um, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab was uh, founded in uh, 1942. The actual roots go a little bit further than that because uh, in the run-up to World War II, uh, I guess it was called the Department of War at the time, uh, had identified uh, a number of uh, major technological issues that really provided an opportunity for working on. One of them was, of course, the uh, development of the atomic bomb. Uh, one of them was the development of radar systems. I think the first that got out in front that the U.S. needs to catch up. The third one was with the, uh, with the advent of, uh, of air warfare, it became quickly apparent that we needed a defense capability against uh, acts particularly against ships uh, because, you know, as it was demonstrated the scene, like, uh, during the war that, uh, that you could take out uh, very large apparatus of ships quite easily with a dive bomber or a torpedo bomber, most of the dive bombers were very effective. And so the problem they were wrestling with was how in the world do you uh, uh, create the ability, and of course this was long before you had the possibility of doing something like a guided missile to take out a, uh, an aircraft before it can drop a bomb on you. And the answer was things like machine guns and small guns couldn't do it, and you needed really to be able to fire off something out of uh, things like the five inch guns uh, that were you know, all over destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and to be able to do that. Of course, hitting an aircraft with one of those was a big problem. They went to what was called the Carnegie Institute at the, uh, the time in uh, DC and said, This is a hard problem. You've got a bunch of smart people. Can you start working on it? Uh, they said yes, and very quickly they realized this was going to grow up to be a bigger project than they could handle out of that. They went to Johns Hopkins University and they put a research group. It was actually first instantiated in a, uh, a uh, took over a car dealership garage in downtown Silver Spring. So if you go down to the metro down there, there's a little plaza about a quarter mile from the metro station, which is where this used to be, with Wolf Motors, to do a Google search. So, uh, so they actually uh, invented what was called the VT fuse, which was really a proximity fuse. But interestingly enough, uh, you know, and everybody talks about around here at least about the development of the VT fuse as uh, you know it was, it was very highly successful. It provided the uh, 
uh, a long-range defense capability to be able to shoot down aircraft. And also then it was adopted by the Army. Uh, Patton was a, was a big fan because it, you know, it allowed them to have a ground air defense, ground-based air defense system uh, too. But to me, the more interesting part of the story was that we pride ourselves here on being a system engineering house. And uh, after the team had uh, had developed the uh, the proximity fuse, and they could fire this thing off and create a, basically a shrapnel cloud when they got close enough to the aircraft, they realized that it was still of, of no use because the gunnery systems were so poor that uh, that the teams could not point the guns quickly enough or reload quickly enough. And so the team, including people like James Van Allen, who later became a uh, space physics explorer, and Van Allen Bell's report named after him, actually went out into the fleet uh, and started re-engineering the gun punching system. So they went from a system that took 18 men to reload and point the gun. You've probably seen these pictures of big hand wheels and everything. Hydraulically driven, they got to a system that, sorry, a system that was hydraulically driven to be operated by three people with a much higher rate of fire and allowed the gunner to actually be able to point the gun quickly enough to be able to track uh, an aircraft and lead it and put the shell close enough that it could. And, then, and so, you know, the, the, the uh, bottom line for, for us is, uh, is our mantra is kind of, it's, you're, not, uh, you're not done until there's an impact for the user, so they can actually use it. And so that, that to me is a seminal story uh, for APL. And, and it's a culture that, uh, that persists to this day. Uh, we became a uh, EOD uh, University Affiliated Research Center, uh, very much like uh, you know JPLs and FFRDC. Only the lawyers can actually understand the difference between them. And over the years, we've had a lot of uh, technological successes, uh, including uh, the first instantiation of satellite navigation. Um, not sure whether you can uh, uh, get in behind the the, uh, the the dates, but there's a, a memorandum that was written. In 1959, quite also quite an interesting story when you talk about Cressy and folks and folks here at the lab that have been working on uh, precision frequency circuits, radio uh, circuits, kind of a, a you know a uh, an evolutionary uh, basis from the uh, VT fuse, and they started tracking the uh, Sputnik uh, and they started listening to the signals. Very quickly realized that they could uh, track the satellite position from the Doppler ship. Within a few weeks, they did a, had a brainstorm, sat down with a couple of folks. There's a memo sitting on the wall that's, uh, that's uh, written in uh, about three months after Sputnik launched that said, hey, guess what? Uh, if we can track the satellite by knowing where we are on the ground and measuring the Doppler, if we put up a satellite, know where it is, and use the Doppler, we can find the position of a ground. And that was at the same time when the uh, the uh, Soviets had recently established a ballistic missile capability. The U.S. was wrestling with that same problem. Of course, one of the big challenges of a submarine launch ballistic missile is knowing where the submarine is, where you launch it, when you want to launch it uh, with the missile so that it can give an initial track. And of course, generally not a really good thing for submarines to come to the surface and take star sightings or you know, uh, listen to war at. So that system was actually put into uh, place within uh, a few months, uh, the Navy had picked up on that and said, go forth and do think, uh, uh, amazing things. The, uh, the lab had created a uh, space department, and so we just last, uh, uh, last year had our 55th uh, anniversary as a, a result of that. So um, I'm going to go a little bit quickly, but uh, within, so your, uh, uh, this building houses about two thirds of the uh, space exploration sector. Uh, we do almost all of the uh, NASA, uh, NOAA, civilian and agency uh, works uh, work, uh, within, the, uh, within the space sector. But we're only about 15% of the lab, depending on whether you count you know, heads or, or budget on that. Uh, so the rest of the lab uh, is involved across the, uh, the full spectrum of uh, both uh, Department of Defense work, Department of Homeland Security, other agency uh, work in supporting a, a, a very large breadth of activities and the, the activities range from technology development uh, to what's what's called the uh, technical direction agent, in which we're, we're actually the agent for the governor, the equivalent of a contractor's technical representative for things like uh, many of the uh, uh, most uh, standard missile uh, tests uh, that the Navy does, the use weapon systems, things like that. And there's a whole plethora of activities uh, in between, and of course. That does span from the bottoms of the 
the ocean and to the near and dear to my heart, of course, is the other end of that is, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, interplanetary missions and, of course, when reaching uh, Pluto this summer. Uh, you know, as I said, we're, we're founded in uh, 1959 um, and uh, uh, coming out of the development of satellite navigation, which became the transit system. If you look in the lobby on the far side next to the cafeteria, there's an engineering unit of one of the transit satellites. And, uh, and if you're at the right angle, more or less from the spot sign, you can look up over the hill. This large dish, 18 meter dish, I guess given it was built in the early 1960s, we should call it a 60 foot dish. Uh, uh, it's up there with built for transit, but, uh, but you know, still it's heavy use today for, you know, for a lot of our science missions. And we've, of course, we've got a, a very customer based work. Uh, within space, uh, the space exploration sector, we're fairly very, uh, uh, very limited. So um, we try to take on missions that are very, very challenging, things where in general can't go off and buy a spacecraft. We will do that if we need to, but uh, certainly our, we feel that our forte is the, uh, the soup to nuts from design, build, test, operate, uh, and finding ways to do that uh, more cheaply. So for example, on New Horizons, um, the, the thing that really made that mission possible was being able to have done some advanced work to develop small sensors, building a very compact satellite compared to the previous things for planetary exploration, getting up small enough and light enough so that once we launched it on what that defined was the most powerful version of the Atlas V, we became the fastest spacecraft ever uh, leave the Earth. Still, uh, still have that distinction, you know, a little tiny spacecraft compared to those taking on a big rocket. Uh, fast flyby, uh, still a baseline and a half years to get to Pluto. Uh, but the other part of the inventiveness was uh, finding ways to have the spacecraft be in an autonomous hibern hibernation most of the time, meaning almost no uh, mission ops uh, oversight in those periods. Uh, periodically send back a tone that says I'm healthy, or a tone that says I need help. Uh, this time we'll return and, uh, and send the signal back. And that, that made a huge difference in the, uh, the mission ops cost. It's a very tiny fraction of the traditional way of having basically the whole ops team is going to need to encounter. Of course, that meant we had to then spin up when we did the encounter uh, last summer. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of these other missions as we go forward. So uh, we're divided into two pieces in the, in the space exploration sector. Uh, uh, civil space uh, primarily, uh, most of it NOAA, but also, uh, sorry, most of it NASA, but uh, uh, a chunk of uh, NOAA and a little bit for, uh, for other agencies. And so these will be you know, missions that, uh, uh, that you'll uh, uh, recognize, like the uh, Mercury Messenger for the New Horizons. Uh, we also do a fair number of instruments. So we have the uh, PRISM instrument on uh, geez, yeah. well, the left. Uh, can't find the button with my glasses. Well, only while I look into the aperture. So that's okay. <laughs> um, anyway, prison mission on um, um, on the um, on Mars Observer was the one that was recently used to uh, find the streaking of uh, the wet areas during the warm seasons uh, on Mars. So, um, you know, lot, lots of fun stuff. National security space side, uh, a lot of things that uh, I can't talk about. Uh, but for example, right now we're developing a uh, a set of sensors uh, that will fly as a hosted payload for, uh, for missile defense to the uh, agency to make a demonstration on uh, uh, cell sensing. Uh, and this is one of the problems there, of course, is if you shoot at something and you like to, and you really want to shot down, you need to know whether you actually killed it or you have to, uh, to shoot it again. So, so pretty wide range of things. And one of the things we do pride ourselves on is we bring things back and forth. So easy example is that uh, You'll see a picture on, on Messenger in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, for the Mercury Messenger, uh, because we're flying downhill and you have to take energy out of that system to get into orbit around Mercury, it was very important to have a lightweight spacecraft. And there's a, a, uh, a quarter scale model of that hanging in the lobby as well. And uh, because you're operating in a very harsh environment, we didn't want to have a large high gain antenna on a gimbal uh, pointing back, so we were able to bring some. Technology has been developed with DOD and phased array antennas 
uh, bring that over. And so we will see on one side of the spacecraft or a space array antenna, which was a, a first use of that kind of technology on uh, the spacecraft, and uh, made a huge difference in both the design of the spacecraft as well as the flexibility of the operations of not having a much impact on being able to do thermal control much more easily. The flip side of that is that on the uh, on uh, Messenger, one of the really serious challenges, and we ended up increasing the uh, the uh, operational return on that mission by more than an order of magnitude in terms of the number of observations made. And that was based on some uh, signing system developments that allowed a very, very uh, agile uh, replanning of the mission observations because this was a very highly elliptical orbit with fast flyby, so it was quite difficult to uh, interleave measurements and uh, Decide which instrument you could operate properly at a given time and then leave all of that. Uh, and that planning software uh, was developed for Messenger, made a huge difference on Messenger, but then we're now feeding that back into some of our uh, more recent uh, national security customer demonstration. Most recently, quite interesting, as far as I know, it's a first that we were able to, using that software, to be able to develop a ground system that uh, we were able to hand over to an untrained operator, and these are military personnel with no satellite cognizance at all. All they know is that it's up there. Uh, be able to give them that software with 45 minutes worth of training and have them operate the satellite and uh, successfully uh, select data uh, using that satellite and, and did so for weeks at a time. It took a little while before we convinced them that you know, there were certain things they should have called home for and asked for help before they just started punching buttons. Okay. Um, so we do span from uh, heliophysics to planetary uh, to Earth science. Um, talked a little bit about uh, you know Van Allen. The, the transition into space for, for us came from people like uh, Van Allen and others realizing that if you could build something that could uh, launch on an artillery shell, you could use that same type of technology to build instrumentation that you could launch on a rocket. And so they started using the uh, uh, some of the capture G2s, there were a lot of uh, homegrown sounding rockets being developed in that area. And uh, very, very early on, started getting measurements of confined radiation belts. The, the famous pictures that you see of the, uh, the curvature of the Earth were one of the instruments on that. So, uh, and we, bit, we do back and forth. Right now, we're about, space exploration sector is about 15%. Uh, national security space, 85% civil, they all shifted back and forth uh, over time. And currently, actually this is a outdated slide, we were operating Messenger until we ran low on fuel and intentionally splatted it into Mercury to make a crater for uh, Betty Colombo to come along in uh, a few years. Of course, New Horizons, we've, uh, we've moved past Pluto, but uh, it's going to take another 14 months before we get all the data back. Uh, we're just in the midst. We've made the first two of four trajectory, trajectory correction maneuvers to heads with another hyperbell object. So, uh, we're successful in proposing an extended mission, which I think we're pretty likely to get that January 2nd, 1919. We'll get, uh, 2019, excuse me. Uh, we'll get another hyperbell object. And of course, we're continuing to operate time. Stereo, air spacecraft in a, uh, uh, Earth diameter orbit in, uh, with one forward and one, uh, backward away. Uh, one of them is still close enough behind the sun that uh, we don't have good communication yet and it's got some technical issues to look out, but the other one's still working fine. And then the uh, Van Allen probes, uh, uh, also known as radiation belt storm probes. So uh, I'm going to go quickly past this. I, I talked a bit about uh, you know, uh, priding ourselves as being a uh, end-to-end -end, uh, systems house. And so, you know, we take that Pretty serious when talking about starting with user needs. And one of the critical things that we've been able to do on things like Solar Probe is making sure that we're really focused on the user needs and stated requirements rather than always trying to do the best things that you possibly could imagine doing with a, with a technology. So, for example, for something like Solar Probe, uh, that turns from being able to rigorously follow uh, that the uh, sets of priorities you know, allowed us to be able to do things for a fraction.
So uh, time, let me, let me go forward because um, I don't want to have start your day off. Um, Mercury Messenger, which I talked about uh, quite a bit, uh, was quite interesting that the uh, Discovery class uh, spacecraft, first spacecraft to orbit uh, Mercury, previous uh, uh, measurement of close-in measurements of Mercury were from Mariner 4, which had done a couple of flybys. And kind of interesting, we have a globe upstairs, which, which is what Mercury, what we knew of Mercury uh, after Mariner 4, and it's a little bit less than half the planet on the globe. The rest of it's just uh, blank, and of course we now fill that in completely, but more importantly, uh, now have full mass answered questions about uh, uh, the early formation of the planet. Uh, we'll see how much shrinkage would have occurred on the planet, and so we're able to narrow down some models of the formation of the solar system. Uh, by having this actual set of data against uh, against those models, because Mercury is one of those extreme cases in the, in the, the formation of cluster testing models that are all right, and show that it has a contrary to uh, uh, earlier expectations, that has a very complex magnetosphere. Um, we've got good measurements of the contraction. It actually had uh, volcanism, which was a bit of a surprise for us, a small uh, body like that. Perhaps more, most surprising to me, you probably saw a few years ago, that there is actually water ice in some of the permanently shadowed craters uh, near the probe. So it's getting cold, so it's kind of funny when you think about something that close into the sun where the average surface temperature in the exposed area is 900 Fahrenheit, but the, the, you know, the poles, uh, they're, they're actually uh, you know, water ice, uh, some very close to the surface of regular, regular Earth and some uh, very down in that. So, of course, uh, I think it's probably impossible to have uh, missed uh, New Horizons uh, this last summer. I uh, talked a little bit about you know, enabling this with a, uh, uh, a very focused uh, compact spacecraft design, very, very high, high performance. Uh, also interesting in this, a very high degree of autonomy. Um, I didn't dare try it this morning because it seems to like some computers and not others, but we have a uh, video of the, the spacecraft has uh, no um, gibble instrument. So everything in terms of repointing the instrument is done by maneuvering the spacecraft to repoint it. So uh, during the, uh, the flyby, of course, since we were four and a half hours light time from Pluto, no possibility of communicating with the spacecraft uh, during that, uh, that flyby. So that whole flyby is autonomous. Quite an amazing dance of, I believe it's almost 900 individual maneuvers or, or commands into the spacecraft to, to do various things, either to repoint or change an operational mode of an instrument all in autonomy. And although we never had to employ it, the autonomy system really had two modes, one pre-flyby in which it saves itself and calls home for, uh, for help, and one during the flyby uh, in which it checks itself out, fails over to whatever it needs to do to, in order to keep operating, and then gets, tries to get back home Timeline. So even if you lost part of the observation, you wouldn't lose the rest. So quite an amazing system. Uh, we only operated it for real once, uh, a little over a week out, which was a heart stopping moment uh, when we actually put size on the computer because we had two operations in the week that we weren't expecting. So, but pretty cool when I first saw that picture. So you're actually, if you saw some of the pictures in the, the newspapers of the science team, you know, cheering and raising their hand, it was actually right here. Uh, you know, in this room, and it's a pretty electric moment when uh, you, know, you first see see an image like that, and you say, "Wow, this isn't you know, this dead ball. This uh, is very clearly a uh, a very active body. There's a lot of things going on. Of course, you you know you've read a lot about the uh, the heart in the lower right, but and you've also seen a lot about the the fact that it has almost no impact crater. So that means that that's a very young surface. And so what in the world is going on on a uh, that's that far from the sun, four and a half billion years old, that can still provide enough energy to, to have an active planet on that. So, lots more data to come. We're just beginning to get the high resolution data, the spectroscopic data that will start uh, sorting that out. So, I think the first science paper just came out in the, in the last couple of days, and you'll start seeing things coming out over the, the next year and a half. So, pretty, pretty amazing place, and we're absolutely thrilled with that. And, also thrilled with the idea that we might get to go see a, uh, a second KBO because there are several different sites and uh, so we we'll be interested in seeing what the next one looks like. So, uh, and Allen probes a little closer to home. Uh, uh, this is uh, being 
water has been built uh, called the uh, radiation balance foam foams. Uh, see here, oops, I uh, don't have the uh, don't have the picture. Is that uh, this is a pair of spacecraft that intentionally are flown through the radiation belts uh, because if we look at how the uh, the sun is affecting the Earth, one of the, one of the major effects uh, on the uh, from the from the sun on the Earth is as we get charged particles streaming out of the Earth, the magnetic field, of course, sends a trajectory, a large fraction of them converted into these uh, these uh, semi-stable orbits in the uh, in the radiation belt. And it's important for a bunch of different reasons because they're not quiescent, uh, and so they vary in both the uh, the the intensity of the uh, particle distribution as well as the extent of the belt, uh, depending on the solar activity, and that in turn uh, affects a lot of things in, in uh, terms of uh, the ground effects, so everything from uh, radiated, uh, uh, radio communications to <coughs> excuse me to uh, things like radiation distribution at the poles or Or as uh, as the you know, the ice caps start to melt, we're going to see more and more activities in the polar region. So, understanding what's going on, uh, you know, almost immediately what the uh, what the team discovered was that the picture that we always had was that these belts were mostly quiescent, that they more or less had the same size, the same shape, the same distribution. We thought that there were differences in intensity, and almost immediately. Uh, Got really good measurements showing that at times when there were high solar activities, there was actually a third belt that formed inside of the, uh, the outer uh, belt. Uh, and that there's actually a lot of structure uh, within these belts that we had no inkling of what's going on. So, uh, ongoing mission, I think we just were coming up to our second extended, end of our second extended mission phase. And uh, we should be able to go on for a number of uh, years more until we're, we're, we're out of fuel and we can't maintain that. Uh, um, we're doing a lot of work here, and as many uh, many of uh, folks are of our uh, uh, looking at CubeSats, we actually have developed a uh, avionics architecture that we believe can work all the way from uh, at least 6U and probably 3U CubeSats all the way up to solar probe class, near, near flagship class missions. A key part of that is also the, uh, uh, the software architecture that goes with that. So we're, you know, we're making heavy use of uh, full flight systems, full flight executive. I mentioned earlier, um, and part of the having a flexible architecture in these days and is making good use of the newest generation of uh, uh, space foam file or FPGAs. And that, of course, then throws us because these are so large, they open up great opportunities, but then they also open up the, the issues that we need to work as a community of, of uh, figuring out how best to, uh, to do these uh, large firmware loads that really look more like. A lot of interesting work there. Uh, really, several uh, cube stats, and uh, our big mission in development right now is uh, Solar Probe Plus, uh, which is a near flagship class uh, mission. Interestingly enough, it's one of the missions that was on the books before NASA became NASA. So there was a group called the Simpson Commission uh, in the uh, mid 50s that was charged with saying, you know, what do we need to be doing in space? Are there things that we can only do in space? Uh, one of the things they identified was needing to go to space floor with a large space telescope, which of course eventually became Hubble and uh, soon to be James Webb. Uh, another one was to understand the uh, the working mechanisms of the sun, uh, which was became Solar Probe Plus. So the key issue there is being able to get in close enough to the sun uh, that you can get detailed measurements of the uh, the flux of particles coming off the sun and the magnetic field. So you've probably seen maps of uh, the, the very torturous uh, magnetic field lines uh, around the sun caused by the uh, flowing plasmas. And understanding how that system works and what causes it at times to have reconnections or breakages in the magnetic, magnetic field lines that uh, can throw very large amounts of mass out of the sun from the coronal mass ejections that can create what's called a Carrington event if we get near the Earth. Carrington event um, date back to the first time we actually knew that the sun really could affect what was going on in the Earth was in 1859 when a British astronomer in Carrington saw a solar flare, a um, very, very bright white light flare with writing, which was, of course, pre photography of uh, the use in astronomy, sketches in his notebook and never seen anything, immediately started. 
started sending telegrams to friends. And over the next few days, realizing that at the time, of course, the high tech system was a telegraph, starting hearing reports in the newspapers about telegraph operators being uh, shocked by spontaneous currents coming out of their systems, some places getting fires. Uh, in other places in New England, there was a report that they actually tried to shut down the telegraph system, we disconnected all the batteries, and the system worked anyway because it was picking up so much uh, potential from ground induced currents. And they were seeing aurora borealis as far south as Savannah. And so Harrington put together all of these reports and said, look, this has to be you know, something from the, the due to this big, large, this large solar flare. And so that became known as Harrington. And of course, the estimates is if that happens today, we're in a very technologically dependent society, is that we could easily be in a situation in which we see you know, very large scale damage uh, to the tune of perhaps trillions of dollars. So there's a lot of work going on now to uh, try to understand how we can harden things like power grids and other systems uh, to do that. But part of the problem, of course, is understanding how these things form and trying to use that knowledge to get another advanced advanced warning of what's going on. So Solar Pro will be actually flying within the outer corona of the sun, uh, the outer corona of the, the surface, the, the uh, um, uh, chromosphere, which is the surface of the sun that you actually see, is at about 5,000 Kelvin. The outer corona of the sun, while it's very tenuous, is actually at about a million degrees Kelvin. We don't understand how that works. So we don't understand you know, how that heating occurs, how, we, how the solar wind is actually accelerated in that process. And, uh, and then how uh, we get these magnetic reconnections. And so by getting flying in close, we're able to do that. The, the big technology, well, lost the solar probe picture off of this chart. Uh, the enabling technology of that is a uh, carbon carbon <coughs> heat shield, carbon foam, carbon face sheets. Uh, front surface of that runs at about 1400 Fahrenheit, the back surface at about 300, and then that's cool enough that with a safe set of radiators that we can then actually have the spacecraft in behind that heat shield running at, uh, at normal room temperature. So some instruments uh, boom, a few cups that actually peak out uh, around the edge. Um, and a few high-tech, low-tech technologies like uh, water-cooled uh, radiator systems uh, for the solar arrays. So that you know, when we're close to the sun, it just, it just a fifth of them peak out because we have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, solar flux, and then when we're out there by Venus, uh, we're very extended and being able to control the temperature. So, quite an interesting mission, and you'll see a lot more of that. So, uh, I talked about the uh, uh, about the, uh, the CubeSats. We believe um, that we are the, the first organization to actually build a pair of CubeSats and turn them over to a military customer to, re to meet a preordained uh, requirement of that. Those were launched. In uh, late 2013, uh, were operational for about a year and a half, and actually just turned over the customer. They operated uh, those spacecraft for well, actually one of them died before they were turned over because it had been a developmental eligible, but the other one was operated until um, <coughs> it uh, deorbited, uh, deorbited by you know non-trained users of them in the 45 minutes they got. So um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a picture of the solar pro. So the thing on the right.
questions for my, we can ask uh, one or two questions, but I, I would like to move to the next keynote speaker, unless anybody has questions. There is one question from me.